we started getting into the basics of spiritual warfare because your life is a spiritual warfare last week. And how many were here last week or listen online? So we're going to piggyback off of last week, but just where we left off is that Satan has no power over the life of a believer. Amen? But he has the power that you give him. So when David was sharing, and I've been there before, and by the way, I'm feeling goosebumps, when we walk in the place, and I taught two weeks before that on God's grace, why is God's grace available to us? Because where sin abounds, that much more does grace abound. Because you cannot get the victory over Satan when you feel condemned. You cannot get the victory over the enemy, over the adversary, when you feel like you have to please the Father. You can't get the victory over the demonic when you feel like you are somehow succumbed to darkness. They sense that. The enemy darkness senses your ability that your head is held high. Have you ever seen someone walk in confidence? I guarantee you, Josh, when he walked around, he was bad stuff right? Wearing his badge, wearing his gun, right? He felt, he felt equipped to handle every situation that came. You had your, your, your sidearm. He, do you carry a taser? A taser. He's got other handcuffs, right? So when he, he's got his bulletproof vest on. So when a police officer begins to do the duty of the work, he not only has all that, but he has the most important thing, which is the badge, the badge is the authority. The authority says, look, I am the one that's enforcing the law, not you. You were violating the law, and now you're going to listen because I'm in charge. Right? So he's exercising authority, and if things get out of control, he can apprehend. He can arrest. Say arrest. You have arresting power over darkness. You have authority over darkness but many times we walk in a state where we actually feel like darkness is kicking our butt, so we let the enemy apprehend us. Amen or ouch? I almost wore that tonight. So we, we made sure that basics of spiritual warfare, because the Christian life is when we come out of darkness and all of a sudden we realize, wait, I was living my life getting my butt kicked by the enemy. And the first thing is, he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he says, I have come to set the captives free, to come to give sight to the blind. What does that mean? Well, not your physical sight, your spiritual sight that you were walking as a slave, walking as a prisoner, walking as a son who knew not the God of the Bible. You were walking as a son of Satan. And guess what? There's bad, bad sons of Satan and there's better sons of Satan, but they're all sons of Satan. And once you were his children, and aren't you great that God not only adopted you, but he gave you his DNA and you're part of his family? He put his seed in you. Amen? So we talked about deception and seduction. We talked about how he siphons power. When David was talking about those times when we come into sin, he's actually siphoning your power. That's what he's doing. You know what sin does? It pulls all the light out of you. And so what is happening in spiritual warfare is what Satan tries to do is bring you into lies, seduction. He brings you into sin and bondage to siphon and to subdue the light. Say the light. We got into that you're the head and not the tail. But we're going to get in tonight into understanding that there is things that a believer needs to do to appropriate the fullness of who you are in Christ. You do not get saved and somehow walk into the fullness of it. And I think one of the biggest tragedies of the modern church today is that we keep Christians in their infancy. And we put them in, our, in their little hands and they, we come to church and we take the baba Take Baba, Baba, oh good. And we teach these little babies to love the bottle. My, one of my daughters, I don't remember which one, maybe it was Selah, 
she would say, Baba, Mama, Baba, Baba. And she was like militant how much she wanted her Baba. Did anybody have any kids like that? They wanted their bottle. Okay, well, I, we did. And sometimes we just gave in to the terrorist and we gave her the bottle. <laughs> We're trying to get her off of it, but she wanted to stay on it. Did anybody have that with their passies? I mean, come on. Because there's something about the human nature that wants to be babied. And so it's not hard to baby the life of a Christian. And you keep them on spiritual milk and they don't even have the appetite for steak. But once you finally learn that God has given you teeth to chew, a baby only has no teeth for a short amount of time. A very short amount of time. And so all of a sudden we're having... I just had a horrible image in my mind. I'm just gonna say it because it, I think the application is true. I don't know how many mothers breastfed, how many mothers breastfed. Well, when babies come out, they have no teeth. And after a while, those babies start growing teeth. I can't imagine going breastfeeding with, with when a baby's got full grown teeth in its mouth and everything else. I, I think things can go a little haywire. Just gotta smack them around, no teeth. But the point is, is that we are to grow teeth to chew into the word, to grow up into the word and understand that the adversary, the devil, he's after one thing and that's if he can never get you to walk in the fullness of God, but first and foremost is to make sure that you never know the Lord, second is to make sure that you never walk in the fullness of the Lord. So he's okay with you being a baby Christian. So we need to understand there's things we must do to appropriate, say appropriate, the things of the kingdom. You ever felt when you were around certain people that they kind of exude the kingdom more than other Christians? And some Christians, which the world may call carnal Christianity, that they still are obsessed with the things of the world. So when you're with them, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, my voice is still recovering from the weekend. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you're around somebody that's carnal, their mouth is gonna be carnal. They're gonna be talking about all of the things of the world. It's not gonna be about what God's doing, what God's saying. And I'm not saying that has to be 100% of your time, right? There's life, you must, there's gonna be normal things. You're, but I'm saying when I'm with people that they have a hunger for God, we're talking about what God said, what God's saying, what God's doing, what they dreamt. What, there is a hunger for the things of the kingdom, amen? So we must appropriate the things of the kingdom. Things like prophecy and the gifts. We teach the gifts because we want you to walk into it. Kathy, when you're in the car, as you're driving in your place of ministry, because every one of you are in ministry right now, right? You, oh, if one day I'm gonna get in ministry. No, you are in ministry. You get saved, you're in ministry, right? Your vocation, your job, your home, whatever, that's your ministry. But when you're in the car, the Lord may give you a word of knowledge when you were walking, and by the way, the Lord uses donkeys and he uses dogs. He used the dog, right? To lead you down to have that encounter in the rendezvous that was a divine appointment. And God uses the gifts, a word of knowledge to rock somebody's world. We talk about faith. Mark 11, verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask, get a hold of this, for in prayer, notice first you must pray. So you're not asking, you're not, if you're not praying, you're not even gonna ask the Father for things. That's the first ouch. There needs to be a dialogue, a prayer life. But he says, therefore I tell you, why is it therefore? If it's therefore, we need to pay attention. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, shout believe that you have received it and it will be yours. This is the law of appropriating the kingdom. You know why some people don't tithe? Because they don't believe that God can actually meet their financial needs. I'll show you where someone spends their time and where someone spends their money and show you what's important to that person. But when you tithe, 
There is a release that says, I believe that first and foremost, I want to support God's kingdom. And secondly, that God can bless me way more than I could do myself. So there's a belief problem when we cannot give God something. Money's one of them. Because you know why money's important? Do you think God really needs your money? He doesn't need anything. You're tested on your ability to what's important to you because to say money's not important is the biggest lie there is. Money is absolutely important. You tell me money's not important to someone who can't pay their mortgage right now. Is money important? Of course it's important. The money matters, but it's not to be exalted. So there's a release in your life that says, hey, I'm gonna trust God with my money and now I put it where money chases me and I'm not chasing money. David, is that not favor? You tell me money doesn't matter to those who are stuck in poverty. We've come to destroy the works of poverty. We've come to destroy the works of sin. We've come to destroy the works of bondage. We've come to destroy all the works of the enemy. Amen? So this is appropriating the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to just cover a few of these very quickly. I have a lot more, but there's very limited time tonight. Jesus said, what father whose son asked for a loaf of bread and would give him a snake? The Holy Spirit is going to get something different. The father will baptize you in the Holy Spirit for the asking. These are part of the gifts that God has given us to walk in the kingdom. So if people are in churches that they're not even teaching the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus over and over said, I must go that I may send your helper to walk in the power and the authority, you know that Jesus did nothing in ministry until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. First 30 years of his life, show me where you see a bunch about outside of him going to the synagogue and actually teaching in the synagogue. But was there any recorded miracles? No. So when the power came, he was full of not just the Holy Spirit, but the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. Yes. Now, getting into spiritual warfare. We cannot fight the battles that you're in without that type of power. It's the, see, see, here's the deal. Without the Holy Spirit, Satan's kingdom is powerful. With the Holy Spirit and salvation, his power has no power over you. Does this make sense? To call Satan powerless for an unbeliever, they, they are in complete bondage to him. But the life of a believer is to understand that there is a parallel universe and if we are in an age where churches aren't even talking about this kingdom of darkness, then you haven't read the Bible. Because the very first story that we see is the serpent in the garden. A serpent. The great serpent, Satan. And so we see that there's a modern day church that many discard even the possibility of a parallel universe this invisible kingdom where Satan resides. We don't know all about it, but we do know that it was one of the temptations that Satan even took Jesus and said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and what? And bow down and what? How many Hollywood, Hollywood actors, celebrities, stars, business owners, have made a deal with the devil. But here's the deal. Your life is no different. My life is no different. Satan has a deal for all of you. It may not be all the riches in the world. It actually may, he may give you the desires of your heart to be a druggie all the days of your life and to sit there and shoot up all the days of your life and he'll minister exactly what he wants to give to you and the whole time through the back door, he'll siphon every bit of life out of you. So we saw through the age of reason that there was this intellectualism where the Bible was reduced to a historical literary writing rather than to divine revelation. 
and ministers of the gospel could teach you about the Bible, but not teach you about the spirit of the living God. You see the difference? I told many this in a, in a few Wednesday nights ago. My first Bible study, Bible class I ever took was at Wright State University. And the professor was not a believer. Teaching the Bible from a historical context. You think she had the revelation of the Spirit of God? Do you think she had, it was a woman, do you think she had the revelation of who God even is? No. So when we begin to teach in our churches a historical literary writing about what Jesus did and he was simply a historical figure. No, he's the king of the universe. He's the creator, he's the great I am. And when you do this, it takes away the fact that there's a spiritual world that is constantly working against you and a spiritual world that's working for you. How many likes the one that's working for you? So Jesus came and the existence of Satan and his kingdom is a matter of divine revelation. Some say that they don't believe that even Satan exists. Most people to some degree believe that Satan exists. But we have to understand that there is a war for your soul even and even more so when you get saved. Anybody ever find themselves in a spiritual war even this week? So the basics of spiritual warfare with this very quick background is to address some of the key scriptures and some of the understanding regarding the basis of spiritual warfare and the problem of evil and the problem and the solution for dealing with it. 1 John 3, verse 8. 1 John 3, verse 8. The one who does what is sinful, this is gonna be an ouch verse. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to, listen to this, the reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy the works of the devil. Is there a spiritual world out there? So Jesus is saying that when your life is about sin, and I'm not talking about when you get born again and your soul man is still working out, breaking free from the power of sin. You hear the difference? But when your life was committed to sin, Jesus is saying that you are of your father, the devil. You are doing what your father has instructed you, which is how to be a cheater, a liar, a gambler, a drunkard, a womanizer, an adulterer. You name it, it's what it is. Someone who envies, someone who strives. He puts his characteristics in you. So the greatest act of love that we see in scripture is that the purpose for the coming of Christ is that Christ took himself for majesty and he made himself clothed in this mortal existence because he was the only rightful second Adam that can destroy the works of Satan. And he did what Adam was unable to do. Jesus said to Adam, I want you to subdue the world, subdue the earth. And Adam was not able to do it, but he succumbed under the power of Satan. How many knows you're not born of the first Adam anymore, but you're born of the son of God, the rightful Adam, who now has restored all things unto his children. Amen? Amen. So this was a great act of love, but it was a great sacrifice that Christ paid. And make no mistake, it was a great spiritual warfare he was in. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, just the last part of the verse Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Does that give you comfort? The battles, the wars, the things you're going through belong to God. The battle belongs to the Lord. You remember that song? How'd the first part? Da, 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 Christy, you remember that song? 
Da, 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 da. Mary, you remember this song? For we sing glory and honor, power and strength to the... the. You remember that? The, yeah, I know, I'm killing it. It's such a good song. We cue that up in the back. So the battle belongs to the Lord. So when you are working on behalf of the Lord, you have to remember that there's a great heaviness that can be lifted when you say, Lord, this is your battle. He's like, finally. He can handle it. Say, he can handle it. He can put it on his shoulders. He's strong enough. He's on his shoulders. His back is strong enough. He, he doesn't even need to sleep. Who's watching over you when you're sleeping? Angels watching over me. All right, I'm done. You know that song? Watch he has over you. You tell me what type of commander would not make sure that his troops are watched over while they're sleeping. You tell me what type of father want to make sure that their children are nestled in safely because God's not just a good father, he's a great commander. And he says, look, your weak bodies are going to get tired, but I've already got a solution for that too. I've got angels that I'm going to dispatch and make sure that when you sleep, there's a heavenly entourage that are governing and watching over you. And even when that's not good enough, and it is, he's got his spirit that's also brooding over you. God is great. He loves his children. He understands that even in all that, there's a war constantly that's after you. But when you begin to understand who you are in his kingdom, and you understand this great cataclysm between light and darkness, you think, God, you're mighty and awesome. The battle is not yours, but God's. So what this is establishing is that Jesus Christ manifesting himself in flesh to destroy the works of the devil. And number two, this isn't your battle, but it's his. Here's the catch, and I've said this many times before. It's one of my go-to scriptures as it relates to understanding who you are in Christ. Jeremiah 51, 20 Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For this I will break in pieces the nations, and with you I will destroy kingdoms. Psalms 144.1 says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war. Put your hands up. And my fingers to fight. So these hands, you look at the majestic nature that your hands can move and your hands can battle and your hands can love. Remember, your hands are an extension of your heart. Get that? Your hands extend your heart. You ever, you ever want to beat somebody down? Well, your hands didn't come up with that idea. Your hands begin to clench when your posture was militant. Yes, Josh? Your blood pressure goes up. Your hands are all lovey-lovey. No, you're clenched up. So you have to understand that your battle is not against flesh and blood. We'll get here. But when you have the posture that the enemy is after your family, the enemy is after your mind, you will all of a sudden get a little bit more militant when it comes to fighting the spiritual forces of darkness. But God demonstrates his power through you. You are his weapon of warfare. You're his weapon of love, but we're talking about spiritual warfare right now. That's, that's what we're talking about. I'm seeing so many Christians, my life is not exempt, under tremendous power to constantly try to steal the joy, to steal the love, to steal. Remember, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we, we're really good. Even the carnal Christian church is really good at quoting that, aren't we? Watch the devil come. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, you better start teaching spiritual warfare then because he's doing a whole lot more stealing than he is giving people things. Blessings back. He is a taker. So God demonstrates his power through you. Say, through me. Leading you by his spirit. We must yield to him. His spirit is going to lead you and you're going to carry it out and you're going to trample Satan under your foot 
And how do we know that? And I've said this many times because it's a part of my life. Remember, spiritual warfare is not just getting up in the name of Jesus. And right, there's a time for that. There's a time in the name of Jesus and decreeing and declaring I to bind you, Satan. That's a, that's a type of spiritual warfare. But spiritual warfare needs to be your, the understanding of your life that would you ever, if there is a shooting range, would you just take a leisurely walk into the shooting range? Nathan, you went to Army basic training. Do you remember what years? Did you, what, we were in about the same time, were we? Oh, okay, I didn't join until 2000. What year, what you, what, when did you get in? Man, you guys are old. <laughs> Do you guys do the live fire where you're low crawling through the live fire? Right, shooting the 60 over your head. You hear zing, 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 zing. So in that live fire, you begin to understand that there's gonna be times where there's live fire, there's rounds. Bro, we got another one, Ed. Ed, when were you in? I forgot we got Army, Army, Army. When, when'd you go in? Bro, that's right, 99. Do you, you remember the live fire? Right, so in that environment, would you, were you gonna stand up? <laughs> okay, let's, let me rephrase that. If, if they didn't know how stupid we actually were and they actually didn't shoot way higher than actually we can get shot, but would we stand up if that it was six foot tall? No. That's spiritual warfare every day that we're walking out, eh, and we're, I don't know what happened, I don't know why this happened, because you're walking around in, a, in live fire getting your head blown off. And you're wondering why you're discouraged. You're wondering why you don't feel like praying. You're, you're wondering why you don't want to go to church. You're wondering why you're caught up into this. You're wondering why you hate your wife or you hate your husband. Because he's been shooting you. Not your physical body. That he, he, look, that's the last. He wants that. Because if he can get you a sickness, he'll kill you. If he can get you with despair, he'll kill you. And hopefully, maybe you'll kill yourself. Guys, this is real stuff. You know how many times in a month I hear people, man, I've been wrestling with suicidal thoughts. Because this life has a lot that Satan's throwing after us. So this is why Jesus is saying, look, and we talked about this last week, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents. Remember the one in the garden? You've got the power. I've given you the power to tread on him. I've given you the authority to tread on him. And over all the power of the enemy, everything he's trying to throw at you, I give you power because he's gonna try to come after you all the days of your life. But I have given you my authority and power. Amen? Amen. And that Greek word power, as you many know, is dunamis, the Greek Word means delegated power. It's delegated to you. Not to use Josh this whole service, but just like Josh had delegated authority from the sheriff's office with arresting powers, with the right to shoot to kill if his life is threatened, he could take your life. If he's in uniform and you're coming after him, he can pull his weapon and kill you. Yes or no? He has the power and he would be completely vindicated for any wrongdoing because his life was in jeopardy. How many times have you shot the enemy with that type of militants? You just came into the wrong house, buddy. Boom! Christian, Christianity is not this nicey nice little thing that they try to teach. You've got an adversary after you. And your kids. You know how many kids right now claim to be some type of homosexual or some type of it or this or cat or whatever? Because there's a great spiritual warfare and of these fathers who were on spiritual milk, many of them Christians, that say, look, look, God makes homosexuals. You got pastors in the pulpit. I have a video clip queued up. He said, I don't know why God made male and female. I think maybe there should have been an in-between, but I'm not God. No, there was no in-between. God made male and female. And those are your only options. And when you compromise that, what happens is you're dancing with the devil. You gave him an inch and he takes a mile. 
So God's given you delegated power. He's given you his gifts. He's given you a spirit that you have all of his voice, his plans. You have all that he is now just living in you. You don't have to call headquarters. You just reflect on what God's leading you to do. And as he teaches you his word and his spirit. So where's our battle? Well, we all know Ephesians chapter six. Let's go there now, Ephesians chapter six. Give me 15 minutes. It's 8.03. I try to have you guys out by eight, but let's get out at 8.15. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, for we wrestle not against what? Who is that? Do you know the greatest way to split a church, the greatest way to split a marriage, the greatest way to ruin a relationship is when you let people become your war. Look, we're gonna, in this life, if marriages have a hard time staying together, which by the way, statistically, marriages in the Christian church have the exact same statistics as the marriages outside of the church. So if we have marriages who love each other, who intimate together, if marriages split apart, don't you think it can happen in a church and in our relationships here too? The enemy doesn't care where he does it as long as he continues to do it. He wants to break apart relationships. But we, people are not your husband, your wife, is not the problem. Look at your spouse, if you have one. Say, you're not the problem. Say, I am. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But, but it's not the spouse. Listen to this. But against prince, say principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to what? He didn't say above all to fight. You're not going to give up the ground. Stand. Not retreat, not withdraw, not to quit, not to give. No, you're to stand. Say stand. stand. That may be all you can do right now. Be honest. Maybe that's all you can do. In another season, you'll get your strength back. Ron, in another season, you'll, all the strength will come back. The vigor will come back. The momentum will come back. The favor comes back. Maybe for a season, all David can do in the season that tested him was stand. Like that's all I can do. The Lord says, I'm not asking you to do anymore. I want you to stand right now. Stand for me. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We'll get into a little bit more of this. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Say, the shield of faith. And you know what you do when you cannot fight and the enemy's coming at you? I've said this so many times. The shield is a long shield. It's a six-foot shield. You get behind your shield and you let the shield take the barrage of the enemy. You're not swinging the sword. When the enemy's coming at you, do you think it's time to get in the way of flying arrows? You let the shield of faith saying, Lord, you will bring me through this. Say it right now. Lord, you will bring me through this. You will get me through this. You will be my protector. You are my protector. Lord, you will not allow the enemy to overcome. And you begin to speak faith-filled words that you will get through this situation. And you read Psalms 91. And you read that the Lord is your shepherd. You read the things and the promises that God is your protector and your provider. And he will not turn you over to the wicked one. And you learn the shield of faith. You notice it's not a shield of comfort. It's a faith-filled shield. Some of you need faith right now. And the word of God is there to say, look, I am who I am, and you will not be overcome by the enemy. It's not against flesh and blood. Your battle's not against man. You will notice that there's four divisions of the demonic. 
I got seven minutes. Let me briefly explain them. There's principalities. Princes, principality are princes. Princes are rulers. Demons are different than principalities. Principalities would be in the serpent category that we're to tread on, which we have the power over. There's a lot of debate in the spiritual warfare world about, about, the, about the heavenly. The way I have studied, the way I've understood through revelation and walking this out, and I'm open to, to other people's opinions on this. I'm not dogmatic. But principalities do absolutely rule over continents, nations, provinces, states, cities, and communities. They're high-level angels that have fallen that are ruling princes over those areas. And I've told you the story about Las Vegas for me. I want to tell it again because you guys live in Las Vegas. Oh, it wasn't Las Vegas. It was California. But I'll tell you about Las Vegas. If you willingly go to Las Vegas to gamble or whatever other shenanigans, you are going to come under the power of principalities. So if you're not a gambler, and maybe you never thought that you would ever go and, and hook up with a prostitute, and all of a sudden you're, you're there to go have a good time, you are now under a power that's going to bring you a temptation that you actually didn't even struggle with. Because you knowingly subjected yourself to a place to partake in its sins. If you go to a district where they're dealing drugs and you go there on purpose, you just might end up getting shot, arrested. Because God's favor's not over that. God's not, you're, you're walking outside his hand of protection. Say, God, how can this happen? No, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. You walked into another principality. You're under a certain power now. You got to know the rules of the kingdom. Okay? You're on your way to church. Can bad things happen on the way to church? Sure, you could fight with your spouse. I know some horrible stories, but what I'm telling you right now is I'll tell you the stories where people walk into darkness. You will always see God's hand of protection be lifted. That's just how it works. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but you're coming into the you're you're coming to feed out of the serpent's hand. There's power spirits. I'll get to that story next week. There's power spirits. These are under the principalities that carry out their orders and control things. And this is maybe hard for some of you to believe, even the elements. Where's the dragon out of the sea come from? I just told you. In Revelation. These are, this is called the marine kingdom. Marine spirits. So there's power spirits. In fact, um, the actual word in the Greek is called archons for principalities, archons. But there's spirits that govern the elements, earth, wind, fire. There's rulers of the darkness. These are governing spirits assigned to organizations and people. There's many people that are rulers of this world system that have rulers of darkness that they rule these people. They become nothing like other than a shell of a human being, Biden, who's literally just a vessel for the demonic. That's all he is. He's just a shell, and that shell has rulers of darkness and other great principalities over the Babylonian system to make sure that he just becomes the vessel for the spirit to occupy. When I stand before you right now, I am of no good unless Holy Spirit works through me, yes or no. So in the kingdom of Babylon, in the kingdom of this world, the rulers, the CEOs, Hollywood entertainment, the school systems, the universities, I'm, I'm talking about the ones where the world system owns them, these people become vessels for other spirits to enter them and to govern the world system through these spiritual world, through these spiritual forces of darkness. There's wicked spirits in high places. These are all in Ephesians 6. I just read them. These are generals in high places up high above that call the shots. 
When you look at a military system, when you look at government, do you realize that all of the governmental system, all of the military systems are modeled after God's kingdom? You think we're smart enough to put together any of this, including the technology right now? No. This was all modeled from a heavenly order, which is what the globalists want, the new world order, a new world order where now Satan is fully in charge of the entire order of the universe. So Paul is telling us that our struggle is not flesh, but what Paul is saying is our struggle is against these spiritual forces that we can't see with our physical eyes, but yet we're to discern and to walk in a manner where we realize that there's a great, the spiritual realm is much greater than the physical. This is the lesser realm. If you've ever watched testimonies about people when they, they had out of body experiences or they, they thought they died or they were dead, right? You have people, that, the colors, the senses, what they smelled, right? The, the, the physical body is limited to the physical domain. The spiritual realm is, is alive. It doesn't mean that this isn't alive too. But when we come with the Lord and come into relationship, everything begins to come alive. Amen? So life on this earth is spiritual warfare. And if this is not true, Jesus would not have come. Behind the scenes, there are controlling factors which are invisible to you that influence governments, nations, organizations, families, individuals, and absolutely even churches. Satan wants this church. He wants the Methodist church. He wants the Brethren church. He wants the Baptist church. He wants the Episcopalian church. He wants the Catholic church. He wants them all. Because as I've said, you and I, collectively the body, we're the only thing standing in the way of Satan carrying out his new world order agenda and to completely have hell on earth. What you see with all the transgender and the LGBTQ, this is just part of hell on earth. Anything you think, you can be a part of it. Do as thou will. Hell on earth, void of God, right? Jesus brought heaven on earth Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as a believer, we're calling for the things of God's kingdom on this earth and walking and appropriating by faith the kingdom on earth. And Satan is saying, I'm bringing my kingdom upon this earth, which is hell. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, next Wednesday, we're gonna get on to a really in-depth of understanding what the armor is, putting on the armor. How do we keep the armor on and walk in the armor? And when do we take it off? Because if anybody's ever worn a uniform, even at work, we have this thing when we come home, we put, I'm just gonna say it, I put on my fat man clothes. <laughs> right? I mean, like it's like one goal's comfort. Nathan, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not saying you're fat. I'm not saying you're fat. I, I mean just comfortable clothes. Oh, Nathan's like, what you talking about? I'm about to go army on you. You're about to do this live fire right now. I just make comfortable clothes all the time, all the time. But putting on the armor, so there's a place to take the armor off. God doesn't, God, God he's a good general. He wants you to rest. But many Christians take off their armor and they don't even keep it on and so they're getting their butt kicked. They're mentally just taxed, they're emotionally taxed, they're spiritually taxed because they haven't had their armor on. And then when they come to church, they're putting their armor on where they don't even need the armor. You come to church right now, we're actually making war but yet we're in a place of worship there's a safety amongst the brethren and amongst the saints that this is a place because you're now in a enclosed 
bivouac area with the perimeter of security by God's heavenly angels that he's saying, come and rest, forsake not the assembly of the brethren, all the more that you see the day of the Lord approaching. We're coming together for worship. Lord's saying, look, I want you to take your shoes off. I want you to get in my presence. I want you to get in intimate with me. And you guess what? In this place, you can take your armor off because I've gone and go ahead and secured the perimeter, son. And I want you to take your armor off and I want you to get comfortable. I want to feed you. I want to refresh you. But some people, the only time they're putting their armor on is when they come to church. They've got it backwards. Oh, brother, I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. And they start going through it because the preacher man's telling them. No, you walk out the door, you better get secured, son. You're in live fire now. You'll pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. I want to speak to those who have been fighting the wrong battle. The Lord would say to you tonight, stop fighting the wrong battle. Stop fighting with your wife. Stop fighting with your husband. Stop fighting with your kids. Stop fighting with your employer. Stop fighting with your neighbor. Stop fighting with yourself. Stop fighting with yourself. You've picked the wrong war. And the Lord is saying tonight that he wants to give you grace and is giving you grace, it's available tonight. He wants to give you comfort and peace knowing that it doesn't matter if you did it wrong, tonight's a turning point, right? Tonight's a turning point. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So put your sword down, put your sword down against the wrong people. Put your sword down against people. Your battle's not against flesh and blood, but against the wickedness and against the darkness. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Father, tonight we just thank you. I wanna play this song as we leave. It's gonna encourage you in Jesus' name, amen.